Okay, welcome everyone. It's another Friday, an exciting Science Friday today. Um, I'm Christian Zoss, I'm the astronomer in charge for iTelescope, and I'm really pleased today to, to introduce to you our youngest ever uh, speaker and very uh, already very uh, uh, very educated and experienced, and it is Aroshi Na from Toronto. Hi, Aroshi, it's so nice to have you. You've given a number of talks already on asteroids, and it's very nice to see such young people, also especially women, coming into the area of science, which is so needed. So, Aroshi, tell us a little bit about you, and it's all yours. Go ahead. For sure. Um, wow, it's great to see so many people here. Um, thanks, Christian, for allowing me to speak on this iTelescope webinar. Um, it's really my pleasure. Um, my name's Arushi, and I'm a grade 8 student, so I'm 13 years old, and I'm from Toronto in Canada. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick and start on my presentation. Sure, go ahead. So, um, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about the asteroid science that I've been doing in the past two years. Um, so this is with the use of Ripley telescopes, Python, open data sets, and maps. So I'm going to get started with a quick poll. How many near-Earth asteroids do you think have been discovered? Um, so Christian, could you please um, start the poll? Yeah, give me a sec. Give me a sec. Um, I will do that. Okay. How many? Yes, here we go. Okay, there comes the poll. Great, so I'm gonna give you guys like 20, 30 seconds to answer the poll. Yeah, we'll give them a we'll give them a minute, yeah. a minute or so. Okay, great. Yeah, I can see the results coming in. It's all working, it's all good. Okay, yeah, don't hesitate to answer. We are, we're getting there. Just gonna give it another 15 seconds. Okay, we'll share the results. What do you think, Arushi? Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, 72 people answered, 43% of people said over 30,000. And to those 43%, you guys are in fact correct. So up to date, yes, change the slide. Up to date, right over 30,000 mirrored asteroids have been discovered. Actually, um, 30,660. So we just passed the 30,000 limit very recently. Um, so just a quick, um, what are asteroids? So asteroids are rocky remnants left over from the early formation of our solar system. Over 1 million asteroids have been discovered in our solar system. Mostly, they go and orbit between Mars and Jupiter. But the orbit of asteroids are not very certain. So sometimes they can go outside these limits. And sometimes they can come close to the Earth. And that's what we call near-Earth asteroids. But if they come even closer to the Earth, um, and they come less than 20 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon to the Earth, um, then they're called potentially hazardous asteroids. So these are the ones that come really close to the Earth. And about over 2,000 of these asteroids have been discovered so far. And these potentially hazardous asteroids have a chance of impacting the Earth. It's definitely not a big chance, but a chance still exists. Sometime, um, for example, 66 million years ago, um, the Chicxulub asteroid impacted the Earth. And this is actually the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. A bit more recently, in 2013, the Chalabinsk asteroid impacted Russia. It caused big damages, and over 1,000 people were injured because of broken glass from windows. And just a week ago, um, near my hometown um, in Toronto, a one meter asteroid entered our atmosphere. And this is actually only the sixth time in history that an asteroid um, had a warning before it entered our solar system. So we had predicted that it would enter in advance. 
Um, so this is what my project is about. My project um, is about five things related to asteroid science. The first part is detecting unknown asteroids. The second part is collecting and calculating their angular velocity. The third part is calculating their apparent magnitude. The fourth part is determining their rotation period. And finally, the fifth part is determining the asteroid's orbital period in terms of binary systems. So this whole project, all these five steps, took me over two years to accomplish because there were a lot of learning stages. And during these two years, I used many tools and softwares. Some of the main ones are robotic telescopes, open data sets, coding in Python, maths, lots of tutorials, and definitely lots of help from online forums and communities. But one of the biggest things I think is practice, patience, and perseverance, because it took me a whole two years to achieve this. And I definitely would not have been able to do it if I wasn't really interested in the subject. So let's talk a bit about my favorite part. This is robotic telescopes. So how do I choose which robotic telescopes to use to image the sky? Robotic telescopes, how did I access them as well? So I chose robotic telescopes located all around the world. Sometimes I had to submit memberships, for example, for iTelescope. Sometimes I had to submit research proposals. This includes the Candace Canadian Space Agency's NEOSAT Space Telescope, as well as the Fox Telescope project from the Las Cumbres Observatory in Australia. Sometimes I had to submit or I had to participate in courses, or even I saw some telescopes through social media, like the Bird Gaffney Observatory Telescope. So these telescopes, as I right before mentioned, are located all around the world, from Canada to Australia, as well as in places like Hawaii and Chile. But after getting robotic telescopes, it's still, there's still a step to do. I have to create observing plans. And these are based on several factors, like the magnitude of the object, the air mass, the transit time. Let's look at a few examples. For example, here I plotted um, asteroid amphorite in both Australia and Canada. And it's obvious which one is the better telescope to use in this case. Because here, the asteroid rises much higher in Australia than it does in Canada. And when it rises higher, this means there'll be less air mass and less interference in the atmosphere, leading to better observations. It's also a reason why whenever observing asteroids, I prefer to observe them during or close to their transit time. That's when they'll be the highest in the horizon. But another thing to take into account is the lunation cycle. Because once there's a full moon, it's harder to observe asteroids, which are dimmer objects, because of the light emitted from the moon, which is why I've always tried to get my observations near the new moon. But that raises some problems because telescopes aren't normally as available during that time and their cost might be higher. So I have to find the in-between to see when's the best time to observe. So this is an example of one of my observing plans that I have used. Um, and one thing I have to take into account is like the exposure time, which is calculated from the lunation cycle and it's the asteroid magnitude, as well as filters and what bidding to use. And after that, I'm able to set my observing plan. So now um, I'm going to talk a bit about what I have done with these images. So I'll be using a lot of Python right now. So I'm just going to set up a quick poll. How many of you guys know about Python? I'm going to give you a minute to answer this question. I wonder how many people are from Florida that are convinced it's a snake, which is also true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's the true, though, yeah. Oh, 
Okay, and let's see the results. Okay, so most of you guys know how to write simple commands. Okay, 22% think it's a snake. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, so um, it doesn't matter if you don't know too much about Python because I'll be going over all the steps that I've used. So um, as I mentioned, I've used Python all throughout my process. Um, I've used several libraries such as NumPy, AfterPy, AstroQuery, Matplotlib, all of them which helped making my algorithm easier. I've also used Jupyter Notebooks to run my code and GitHub to make it publicly available to everyone around the world. So let's go back to the Rubai telescopes. Once I had gotten my images, um, they had come in something called FITS files. So these aren't just the normal JPEG or PNG files. FITS files contain two stuff. First is the image of the sky, and the second is the header, which contains important information like the metadata. So let's look a bit first at the FITS files header. So um, once I opened the header, I found pages worth of information, but not all of it would be essential for my algorithm. So I um, queried the algorithm. Um, I made a query algorithm um, in Python to query for only the essential information that I'll use in my algorithm. So this includes the right ascension and declination of my image, information about the camera, like the pixel scale and the pixel size, the focal length, the field of view, and the time I observed this image in UTC. So once I had extracted all this information, I was able to continue on to the next step which is the image part of the FITS files. So once I opened the image for the first time, I saw just a black image with maybe one or two bright pixels in the image. So this called me really confused. Had I overexposed the image? Had I underexposed the image? What had happened? And it took me a lot of time to figure it out, but I found out it's because I needed to scale my image first. So what scaling does is it reduces the range of pixel brightness in the image. Because in the image, the change, like there are stars, there's the background, and the stars have a very high pixel value, while the background has a very low pixel value, which means that because of this high range, only the very bright objects can come in. So um, to scale my image, I found the mean pixel brightness in my image and scaled the range to one or two standard deviation above and below the mean. And as you can see in the bottom right, here's the scaled image that I can get where both bright and dimmer objects are visible. And if you're curious to see exactly how the process of scaling works, um, in this example, I've used a software called Sao Image um, DS9. So um, as I've reduced the range, you can slowly start to see more dimmer objects. Tail in final one, you can see all the objects or most of the objects in the image. So now let's go on to the first part of my asteroid signs detecting unknown asteroids. So to do so, I used many open data sets because I thought the best way to find an unknown asteroid in my image is to first find all the known objects in my image and then eliminate them. So how did I go about this? To find all known objects, I first want to find all the known stars. So I queried the USNOB1 star catalog and the Gaia early data release star catalog to find all known stars in my image. But this wasn't enough because I didn't want to start de de detecting sorry, um, asteroids that were already discovered, which means I had to also find all known asteroids in my image, so ones that are already detected. And this was a bit different than stars because for stars, I had only had the um, query for um, the field of view and the position of my image. But asteroids, unlike stars, are moving objects. This means that their position in the sky will change over time. So while querying for asteroids, I can include the time as well as the field of view and the position of my image. So to find known asteroids, I queried the NASA Horizons JPL database. So let's look first look at querying the stars. So I created a Python algorithm to query the Gaia star catalog. I mentioned the USNOB1 star catalog previously, but I stopped using it because I found out it was outdated. So now I've been using the Gaia star catalog, 
So after querying all the objects in my image in its field of view, I got a list of all the positions of all the known asteroids, so their right ascension and declination, and their celestial coordinates. But in my image, I wanted to find these objects in my image, not in the right ascension declination coordinates. And right ascension declination coordinates are kind of like a celestial coordinate, so they're in a sphere, while my image is a flat plane. So I use something called a mnemonic projection to project the images, the right ascension declination coordinates, onto my pixel coordinates. And that way, um, this again using a Python code, I was able to find the pixel coordinates of all the known stars in my image. But once I overlaid these pixel coordinates onto my image, I noticed they did not match at all with the objects in my image. So this got me really confused and it took me actually a couple of weeks to find a solution to this. And the fix was actually quite simple. So let's assume that this paper here is my image. So here we have the center, which is where the right ascension definition coordinates is from. But let's say I rotate the image 90 degrees. The center still stays the same. The field of view also stays the same. I rotate another 90 degrees and the center still stays the same. I could do the same thing by flipping the image in the x-axis or the y-axis. And the center of the image would still stay the same. So this meant that my image could have been rotated or flipped and I would not have known it. So that meant, so as you can see in this image here, um, rotating it 90, 180, and 270 degrees, it stays the field of view and the image position stays the same. So I created a Python algorithm, which rotates my image till it finds a perfect match. And as you can see in the bottom image on the right, that all the objects have been matched after a rotation of 180 degrees, which was a success. So the next part was finding the known asteroids. So for this, I used a NASA Horizons database. I created another code to query um, the known asteroids in my image's field of view, but also using the time, as I mentioned before. And after that, I was able to find all known objects in my image, as you can see in the right image. But now it was time to eliminate these objects. So how did I go about this? So to eliminate these objects, I wanted to put a mask on top of them just to completely remove them from the image. So to do so, I made two simple assumptions. The first assumption is that known objects, so stars and asteroids, are always circular in shape. The second assumption is that they're brightest at the center. And as you go further from the center towards the edge of the object, they become dimmer. And using these two assumptions, I made circular masks on my objects. But this wasn't enough because objects vary in size. Some objects can be smaller, some can be bigger. So how do I create mass so that it eliminates only the object and nothing else? So to do so, I created custom size masks for each object. The masks were created depending on how many bright pixels were, ins were inside each object. Based on that, I used a circular area formula to find the radius of each mask. And then I was able to create different masks for each object in my image, again, using a Python algorithm. So as you can see in the bottom right figure, all the objects have been completely masked out. The ones in black are known stars, while the one in yellow is known asteroids. So I was able to verify that my algorithm was working correctly for all images by looking at how many pixels of each brightness was there. Without masking, I noticed several more in between 250 and 350 brightness, then after masking. And after masking, I also noticed an increase in pixels of zero, which is the mask. So that meant that my algorithm was working correctly. So as you can see in this figure, um, I have my image and all the black objects are the known objects. While the red objects are the unknown objects or the objects that haven't been mapped as known stars or known asteroids. So these are the objects of interest for me. So what I did is I removed all the black objects or subtracted all the known objects from my image and I was left with the red objects. 
I've plotted a few, four of them here. But as you might notice, two of them, the two on the bottom, definitely do not look like astro candidates. This is the limitation of my algorithm. My algorithm cannot properly analyze objects that are either near the edge of the image or that are in a cluster star field. So I had to remove these two objects manually. And then I was left with my two possible astro candidates. I repeated this process, I've repeated my algorithm on several images around 30 and got 50 possible astro candidates. I submitted them all to the Minor Planet Center database, which keeps track of all known asteroids. Three of my detections were selected as preliminary asteroids. A preliminary asteroid is a first detection of an asteroid. So this meant that this, my algorithm was very successful. So I was still curious. I wanted to more learn more about asteroids. I wanted to specifically calculate their angular velocity. So how did I do this? Let's look at an example of an asteroid, in this case, Apophis. I took an image of Apophis one day, and I took an image of Apophis the day right after. I plate solved each of these images, and I was able to get the very center and detonation coordinates of the asteroid in both images. So these images were taken using the Fox telescope set. So how do I calculate the angular velocity of the asteroid? This is slightly different since distance between the right ascensions change over depending on where you're looking at. For example, if you're near the poles, the distance between right ascension is zero. But when you go closer to the center, it becomes more. So I used a uh, function which used included the uh, cost um, trigonometric function, as well as the Pythagorean theorem to find how much the asteroid has moved in one day. And based on that, I was able to find that the asteroid apophis moved 0.011 arc seconds in once per second in my image. Again, this is um, the proper motion, which means this is just the motion as viewed from the Earth. So in two dimensional, um, the asteroid could have been moving towards us or away from us but we wouldn't have been able to know that. But I was still curious. I still want to find out more about asteroids. In particular, I want to find out the asteroid magnitude because the magnitude of the asteroid could lead to some interesting information about the form of the asteroid, of its shape, or its rotation. So I'm gonna take a quick detour to talk about the DART mission. So first, how many guys of you guys know about the DART mission? Again, I'll give you a minute to answer this question. It is a sports game too, for sure. <laughs> <It's a dog. laughs> I like that choice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wow. So most of you guys know um, it is a mission to an asteroid. Some of you guys, two people thought um, it was something else, won a mission to Mars, won a sports game. Well, it's great. Um, so most of you guys know what the um, DART mission is. So let's go on. I'm just going to give a quick overview of the DART mission anyways. So the DART mission is a mission launched by NASA um, to impact an asteroid, Didymos. So Didymos is a binary asteroid, and um, on the 26th of September, um, the DART mission impacted successfully impacted the Didymos asteroid system. It impacted Didymos's moonlet called Dimorphos. And this impact was viewed from many places. This impact was viewed from space, 
whether it's the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope, it was also viewed by big um, observatories around the world, like the Las Cumbres Observatory and the Atlas. But since Deimos was very bright during this impact, many amateur astronomers also got the opportunity to view this asteroid impact. But impacting the Deimos wasn't the only goal of DART. DART also, um, the goal of DART was also to cause a change in the binary orbital period by at, of at least 73 seconds. Another big goal was to measure, so to see how effective um, the mission was at changing the momentum of the asteroid. So how effective was the momentum transfer? Um, and three of these goals have already been successful. The fourth one is still to determine during time. So um, going back to my goal now, I wanted to measure the magnitude of the asteroid. So how did I go about this? To do so, I went towards asteroid photometry, in particular, differential photometry. So what is differential photometry? Um, while observing, observing conditions can change during the observation because observations are very long, three to four hours. So um, during this time, how will we be able to see that the change in the magnitude of an object is caused by the object itself and not the observing conditions? This is where surrounding objects come in because we know the brightness or the magnitude of stars in the image, which means knowing how the brightness that they appear in the image, we'll be able to see if any observing conditions change the brightness over time. And based on that, we'll be able to subtract those bad seeing conditions and be left with the magnitude of the asteroid. So the first step to finding um, the asteroid magnitude is to first find the asteroid in the image. So first, um, you need two circles while looking at the asteroid. One circle is to contain the object, so that you know the limits of the object in the image. But there's also another circle to look at the background noise and to see the change in background noise over time, so that you can subtract the background noise from the asteroid's magnitude. And after this, you're able to find the magnitude of the asteroid in the image. And looking at several images, taken one after the other, you're going to be able to see or make a light curve and to find interesting information about the asteroid. So I followed a couple of steps to finding um, the magnitude of this asteroid. First step was selecting a good aperture radius. So this was slightly harder because too big an aperture and I would include a lot of noise in my observations. Too small an aperture and I wouldn't include the full asteroid in my observations. So I had to find the mix in between these two to set the right aperture. The next step was finding comparison stars. This is um, an important step because not all stars are suitable to become comparison stars. For example, if the star is either too big or too small, your magnitude might vary a lot during the observation. Also, if for some reason the star brightness is changing over time, then that's not an ideal comparison star either. So as you can see in the bottom left, this is a suitable comparison star because its brightness remains the same over time. Normally in each image, I would select about four to seven comparison stars for my observation. The third step was actually creating light curves of the asteroid. So this is um, a, a, on several images of the asteroid, looking at the magnitude in each one of them and then creating a light curve. But often, once looking at, for example, the rotational period, um, one observation is not enough, which is why you have to combine several observations to get a more accurate rotational period. Um, and while compare, um, adding observations from different days, you have to be careful about a few things, because you have to apply the phase angles and offsets. Because if for the offsets, if the asteroid is coming closer towards the Earth or going further towards the Earth, then we don't want that magnitude to be, we're not interested in that magnitude because right now we're only looking at the curve that it's, the asteroid is creating. Similarly, if we're looking at the phase angle, so the angle between us, the Earth, the asteroid, and the Sun, 
um, if while it changes, the magnitude of the asteroid can also change. So we have to eliminate these factors before um, finding all the observations and adding them together, as you can see in this figure. So now, as I mentioned before, my goal was to find the magnitude of Didymos. So to do so, I took several observations of the system, both before and both after the impact, and calculated the magnitude of the asteroid for both. So as you can see here, the circles in blue is the magnitude that the asteroid should have been if the DART mission had not impacted. And the orange is my own observations. So this is with the DART mission impact. So as you can see, before the impact, the magnitude um, computed by my images and the magnitude estimated is around the same. But right after the impact, you can see a huge increase decrease in a magnitude um, computed by my image. And this is because during the impact, um, the asteroid became much brighter. And as you can see, around a month later, it starts, sorry, around, um, yeah, a month later, it starts to go back down and resume its normal magnitude. And um, my light curve um, corresponded with um, light curves designed by other people. For example, from the Atlas um, database, they also include, uh, they also saw a sharp increase in the, or decrease in the magnitude of the DEMOS um, right after the impact. And then it slowly went back to the, um, down to normal readings. So now let's look at the fourth part of the asteroid science, finding the rotational period of the asteroid. So how can we find the rotational period of an asteroid? This comes from light curves. Because let's say we have an asteroid. Asteroids are normally not circular or spherical. They're not because, and the reason because of this um, is because asteroids are smaller, which means they have a less gravitational pull, which means that they don't have enough gravitational pull to make themselves a sphere. So as they rotate, you'll be able to see once the more, more um, surface area of the asteroid is visible, the reflected brightness will be more. While when um, the smaller surface area of the asteroid is visible, the reflected light will be less, as you can see in these light curves. Um, and in the case of Didymos, the object of interest, the light curve I was getting, the rotational period I was getting was 2.26 hours. So um, combining all my observations pre-impact, my um, rotational period I was able to get correlated with the rotational period of the asteroid Didymos. So I was able to get 2.26 um, hours. And the amplitude, which is the variance in the brightness, I was able to get 0 0.114, which is very close to the expected amount. Now let's look at my observations post-impact. I did the same process and looked at the magnitude of the DEMOS after the impact. Here, I calculated the same rotational period, which means the rotational period is unchanged so far. And the light curve amplitude, I calculated 0 0.063. So now let's look a bit more at the rotational period of the asteroid. Most asteroids, have a rotational period above 2.2 hours. So why is this? Because asteroids, if they rotate faster than that, so if their rotational period is less than 2.2 hours, then they would fly apart unless they're really strength bound. But most asteroids are made out of rubble, which means if they went and um, rotated any faster, they would fly apart. Which means that Didymos, while it definitely is partly rubble, it also has to be strand bound by some extent or it would have flown apart in this much time. And just a comparison about how Didymos's rotational period compares to other asteroids, let's look at two other examples, Bennu and Ryugu. Um, so uh, Ryugu has around the same um, diameter of Didymos. So Didymos's diameter is 800 meters, while Ryugu is 900 meters. But you can see 
that its, much, its rotational period is much more. Similarly, if you're looking at asteroid Bennu, which is around half the size of Didymos, while its rotational period is um, less than Didy Ryugu, it is still um, more than Didymos. So finally, let's look at the fifth part of my asteroid signs. Find the orbital period of asteroids. And since Didymos is a binary system, it was an excellent um, system to test this algorithm on. So first, let's go through a quick poll. In the binary asteroid system, how many dips would be observed in the light curve per orbit? Okay, so most of you guys said two, and uh, some of you guys said one or three. Okay, now let's look at the correct answer right now. Okay, so binary asteroids have three different mutual events, which means three different light dips would be observed. So to whoever said three, you are correct. So let's look at the three different mutual events. The first is the primary occultation. This is when Dimorphos is passing in front of Didymos. The primary eclipse is when the Dimorphos is shadow is passing in front of Didymos. And finally, the secondary occultation. This is where Didymos is passing in front of the moonlight. So this is the opposite. So these are the three um, mutual events. And currently, the orbital period or the orbital period of the Deimos used to be 11 hours and 55 minutes, but after the impact, over almost a 25 minute um, change in the orbital period was discovered, as the new orbital period changed to 11 hours and 23 minutes. So this is much more than the expected amount from before. So I wanted to also measure the mutual events in um, my observations, and I was actually able to capture one of the mutual events. And this is a possible eclipsing. So as you can see here um, in the curve, most are going according to the curve, uh, most of my readings, but there's one where there's a dip um, observed and this is the eclipsing. So it's pretty amazing that in one of my observations, I was able to observe an eclipsing. Um, I also did some other asteroid science, um, not part of those five steps. Um, one of them is finding the tail of the Deimos, um, right after the impact. So I computed it on several days, um, like over a, a month after the impact, and I found some really interesting results. But first, how did I compute the length of the tail? Um, to do so, I used the pixel scale of uh, my image, as well as how long it seemed or how many pixels the tail was occupying. Based on that, and with some simple multiplication, I was able to find the tail length. Repeating this project, this process, on all of my observations, I found really interesting results. Right after the impact, there wasn't much of a tail, but after that, it developed even further. Till the 30th, till the 1st October, where it went almost or above 20,000 kilometers long. But after that, I noticed a sharp decrease in the length of the tail. And then after that, it resumed coming bigger, the tail became bigger again. So the reason why the tail became bigger again is still not completely known, though um, lots of people have observed um, an increase in the tail after, and it's suspected that there's been a second tail that's also um, come. 
And um, some other observations of I've been doing is from a space telescope. So after submitting a research proposal, I was able to get access to the Canadian Space Agency's new SAT telescope, where I've been able to get some observations of Diddy Moss. Um, magnitude errors are currently high um, because there's a low SNR. Um, but I'm currently getting more observations, which I will be analyzing in the future so that I can see the changes that happened in the Diddy Moss system. And one last thing I want to mention is some other fun science I've been doing. This is measuring um, the distance, for example, the distance between Diddy Moss and Dimorphos, calculated from the image that the telescope um, provided, the telescope on the DART mission. And um, another, I was able to find that the distance was 920 kilometers based on my calculations. Um, while the actual distance is 1,200 meters. Another one I did was the diameter of um, Dimorphos. I calculated 273 meters, while the actual diameter was 170 meters. Another one I found was um, right before the impact, I was looking at the size of some of the rubble on a Dimorphos surface, and I found this um, rubble to be 10 meters long. So my observations aren't completely accurate, but these were just some rough estimates I made. And I have published all of the code that I've done um, on my GitHub training module, which you can see the link here, as well as I've published um, some of my observations in the AlcDef database, um, where um, that's a database where light curves and images of asteroids are stored. I've also given seven presentations like this one, um, whether it's at the AVSO uh, meetings or um, at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada monthly meetings, because I believe the best way to fully learn about something is to share it to others in such a way that they can understand it, because it shows that you have full mastery of the subject. I've also won several awards for my project, including the best award at the 2022 Canada Wide Science Fair in addition to an Excellence in Astronomy Award. Previously, I've also won several awards like the NASA Space Apps Global Winner and the Canadian Space Apps National Winner. I would like to thank so many people who have made my project possible. One of them, I won't mention all of them, but some of the main ones is um, Christina Thomas from the DART Mission Group, um, who helped me through my project. Um, I was able to meet her um, on a Zoom meeting, and I discussed my project with her, and she gave me lots of feedback. Another one is, of course, the Eye Telescope Observations, um, Eye Telescope Observatory, and Christian, um, Madeline, and Leigh, who have supported my observations for the whole month, and many other people. Um, this wraps up to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Awushi. Can you just stop sharing the screen so we can see you full size sure. again? Well, Awushi, really bravo. Absolutely superb, superb.